Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. Hello, Warbirders. This is part two of a series, so if you haven't seen part one, where I talk about inline and the whole alphabet of cylinder configurations, such as V, X, H, W engines, go ahead and catch up there and then come back here. Unlike the types of inline engines, the circular configuration usually has to have an odd number of cylinders to be balanced. The first type was known as a rotary engine, where the cylinders spin around a fixed crankshaft. There were some advantages to what sounds like a crazy system. Spinning the cylinders was very effective in cooling because the hot bits were moving through cooling air even while idling or taxiing and this allowed for weight reduction as the cooling fins could be smaller. The mass of the spinning cylinders acted as a flywheel leading to smooth operation. But there were disadvantages too. Spinning this big hunk of metal leads to a gyroscopic effect that makes the aircraft hard to handle as soon as you want to turn, which of course is what you want to do in combat. Also with many rotaries the throttle system was tricky to control and some essentially had only two power settings, full blast and off. In order to reduce power for taxiing or landing, something called a blip switch was used to cut the spark to the cylinders and thus reduce power. Of course, the fuel and oil were still flowing, which could cause fires downstream in the exhaust systems and lower cowling. The limited power setting controls meant that fuel consumption was high with rotaries. Another major disadvantage was the lubrication system, which was known as total loss. All the lubricating oil, which was often castor oil, was ejected with the exhaust and blown in the pilot's face leading to them getting soaked in and ingesting the oil. Castor oil has been used for centuries as a laxative, so having it blown in their faces would give the pilots persistent diarrhea. Not a pleasant effect to have, especially in a single-seat fighter. You know that white scarf that's characteristic of the World War I pilot? Part of its purpose was for wiping off the goggles of all that sprayed oil. Even with their limitations, many World War I aircraft ran on rotary engines, such as the multiple variants of the French Le Rhone 9J built by Nom et Rhone. Interestingly enough, many of Germany's aircraft in World War I were powered by a license-built version known as Oberussel UR-11, which was made by Motorenfabrik Oberussel. But eventually the limitations of the rotaries outweighed their advantages and engine designers began fixing the cylinders in place and turning a central crankshaft attached to a propeller. And this is known as the radial engine. Like the rotary, they have fewer problems with cooling than all the inline types. For along with increases in power, there are also corresponding increases in heat generation. With most of the inline types, whether straight, V's, H's, or X's, any cylinder further back than the front one will require some help in being cooled. This necessitates liquid cooling, using a circulating fluid to bring the waste heat from the engine to a radiator to get rid of it. Of course, this is an added weight and complexity, and a cause for concern with combat aircraft, where a single bullet in the system can be catastrophic. The radial engine doesn't need liquid cooling. Enough of the cylinders are exposed to the airstream in order to carry the heat away. Of course, that meant more frontal face to the engine, which meant more drag. But the radials were considered more reliable and had a better power to weight ratio. They also needed to be pulled through before starting to clear the oil that had accumulated out of the bottom cylinders. But as I said in the beginning, everything is a compromise. In 1935, Lindbergh flew the Atlantic with a 9-cylinder Wright 225 horsepower J5 Whirlwind radial engine. Pratt & Whitney's first radial, also a 9-cylinder, the R1340 Wasp, was the beginning of a long line of Wasp-type radials. 
Any more than nine cylinders in a circle would be too unwieldy. So the idea came to put a second row of cylinders behind the first. One of these was the incredible 14-cylinder Pratt & Whitney R1830 twin wasp engine. Pratt & Whitney built more than 173,000 of them. And they were used in several of the most popular aircraft ever built. The four-engined B-24 heavy bomber and the twin-engined DC-3, as well as the military's C-47 Skytrain, the Grumman F-4F Wildcat fighter, consolidated PBY Catalina seaplane, Douglas TBD Devastator torpedo bomber, short Sunderland seaplane, and Vickers Wellington bomber. Although these aircraft also used other engines too in various configurations. It produced 1,200 horsepower at takeoff and is still in service today. Its contemporary from Wright was the R2600 Twin Cyclone, which generally produced 1,600 horsepower at takeoff and was used in Boeing's 314 Clipper seaplane, the Brewster SB2A Buccaneer, Curtis SB2C Helldiver, Douglas A20 Havoc, and B23 Dragon, Grumman TBF Avenger, and North American B25 Mitchell. Wright built over 50,000 of those. With two rows of cylinders, this meant that the rear ones were in danger of not getting enough cooling air and overheating. This was solved by introducing baffles in order to direct the cooling airflow to where it was needed. German aero engine designers had some other ideas. For example, the BMW 801, which powered the Focke-Wulf FW190 and Junkers JU88, had a little engine-driven cooling fan just behind the propeller. When I first saw this, I didn't understand why they would need a fan there when there was a big prop right in front. But now I understand that especially on the ground, when there is little airflow from the prop, especially near the hub, the fan does the job of sending the cooling air through the cowling. Although when we mention British airplane engines of World War II, everyone thinks of the Rolls-Royce Merlin, the Brits built radials too. The nine-cylinder Bristol Mercury was used to power the Westland Lysander and the Bristol Blenheim. Bristol produced more than 57,400 radial Hercules engines to power the Vickers Wellington, Short Sterling, Handley Page Halifax, and even some versions of the Avril Lancaster. The Hercules employed sleeve valves rather than the usual poppet valves. Sleeve valves work by having ports in the cylinder walls that come into alignment with the cylinder's inlet and exhaust ports at the right time in the combustion cycle. At one time, this technology was thought to be superior to poppet valves because the earlier poppets would build up carbon, which needed to be removed. Sticking with British sleeve valve technology, we also had the Bristol Centaurus, which was an 18-cylinder, two-row design with 3,272 square inches, that's 53.6 liters of displacement, that would eventually deliver over 3,000 horsepower. It was a development on their Hercules engine that we mentioned before. In order to get even more engine volume, designers used two rows of nine cylinders instead of two rows of seven, and they increased the stroke of the pistons. They were used to provide power for Hawker Tempest and Sea Furies during the war, and civilian aircraft such as the Airspeed Ambassador and Blackburn Beverly after the war. Back in the States, the Wright R-3350 duplex cyclone was a twin-row, supercharged, air-cooled radial engine with 18 cylinders displacing almost 55 liters. Depending on the model, this engine could produce power ranging from 2,200 to over 3,700 horsepower. This was the engine that was rushed into production for the B-29 as the bomber itself was being rushed to be built for the war in the Pacific. The B-29 had major engine issues in the beginning as there just wasn't enough space between the cylinder baffles and the cowling. A bit like the HE-177 I mentioned in the previous episode. 
This just didn't allow for adequate cooling, especially at low speeds, and the rear cylinders got hot enough to burst into flames. The B-29 prototype's second flight was ended early due to an engine fire, and the second prototype was destroyed and the entire crew was killed due to another engine fire. The B-29 struggled with their R-3350 duplex cyclone engines throughout the entire campaign as they were asked to haul overweight aircraft up to extreme altitudes where they were really at the edge of the power needed for the aircraft. When it came time to upgrade the B-29 to the B-50, one of the first things they did was to swap out the R-3350 duplex cyclone for its more powerful competitor built by Pratt & Whitney, the r 4360 WASP Major. Now, I don't want to leave you with the impression that the R3350 duplex cyclone was some sort of failure. It's simply the story of a technology being rushed due to the pressures of war. As the engine was allowed to mature, it became incredibly reliable and used in many, many aircraft in both military and civilian applications that are too many to list. But a few examples are the Douglas A-1 Sky Raider that was in service for two more wars and up to 1985, the Fairchild C-119 Flying Boxcar, the Lockheed Constellation and Super Constellation, and the Lockheed P-2 Neptune and Martin J-R-M Mars, which was just retired as a firefighter, and the R-3350, is used as the engine on Hawker Sea Fury and Grumman F-8F Bearcat Unlimited Class Racers. The Pratt & Whitney R-4360 Wasp Major can be considered the culmination of the evolution of what started with the Wright Brothers' little four-cylinder, 12-horsepower engine. The Wasp Major was a beast of a machine that was conceived during World War II, however, was developed too late to see service in that conflict. It contained a shocking 28 air-cooled cylinders organized in four radial rows. In order to deal with the always problematic cooling issues, each row of seven cylinders was slightly offset in order to allow for better airflow. This gave the engine its distinctive look and its corncob nickname. It displaced 4,362.5 cubic inches, which is 71 liters. In case you're curious, that displacement is the equivalent of 14 Ford F-150 truck engines. The Wasp Major could produce 3,500 to 4,000 horsepower. As mentioned before, it was used in the B-50, the upgrade to the B-29, the double-decker Boeing 377 Stratocruiser and Boeing KC-97 Stratofreighter, were powered by them. Six of them were mounted in the Convair B-36 Peacemaker as well as the Hughes H-4 Hercules, more commonly known as the Spruce Goose. So, in our quest for power, we've reached the end of the line when it comes to physically adding more or bigger cylinders. But, there are ways of squeezing even more power out of the cylinders you've got. Now, some of these types of power squeezing features in piston airplane engines are superchargers, turbochargers, water and methanol systems, and nitrous oxide injection, turbo compounding, and using different octane blends of fuels. In this continuing series, we will be looking at all of these. But in the next video, we will be looking at superchargers and turbochargers. It may not be out yet, so be sure to subscribe to this channel in order to not miss a thing. Let me know in the comments if you like this kind of content and if you really appreciate it, I would love it if you sent me a super thanks or become a member of the channel. Till next time.